Disney's animated classic Aladdin is one of the studio's most treasured movies, but after many years of rewatching it, fans have unearthed some surprising plot holes, problems and mistakes in the original animation. yippee ki movie lovers, I'm Jan, and in this video I'm explaining how the live-action remake of Aladdin fixes many of those issues from the 1992 movie. Some spoilers ahead, so take care if you haven't seen the film yet. And don't forget my Aladdin giveaway is also running, so be sure to subscribe and leave a comment for your chance to win. Let's kick off with a popular fan theory that the genie failed to grant Aladdin all of his three wishes in the original movie. Wish fulfillment? Three wishes to be exact. An ixnay on the wishing for more wishes. It's the second wish where the genie saves Aladdin from drowning which is the most problematic. In both the animation and the new film, Aladdin is tied up and has passed out, so even though his hand brushes against the lamp, he can't ask for a wish from the genie. Oh, you can't cheat on this one. I can't help you unless you make a wish. You have to say, Genie, I want you to save my life. Got it? Many fans think that because Aladdin never explicitly asked for his second wish... Now, was that an official wish? Say the magic words. ...that technically the Genie never gave that second wish to Aladdin. The new movie has a neat little fix for this issue by introducing the idea of grey areas when it comes to Genie's granting wishes. Hey, can you make me a prince? There is a lot of grey area in Make Me a Prince. So when Aladdin is on the verge of drowning in the new movie, the genie creates a backdated contract and moves Aladdin's hand to sign it. The document, which is dated the day before Aladdin was pushed into the sea, declares that for his second wish, he wants to be saved from certain doom. This grey area that the genie uses is a sneaky way to resolve how many wishes were granted to Aladdin, and it's also used again later in the movie when the genie grants Jafar his three wishes. And by the way, the filmmakers are clearly aware that the audience may be checking on how many wishes are granted in the new movie, because just before he grants Aladdin his first wish to become a prince, the genie says this is an official wish for those of us who are counting. In the original A Whole New World song, Aladdin and Jasmine fly all the way from Agrabah, past the pyramids in Egypt, through Greece and finally end up in China, all in just one night. Although it's supposed to be a fantastical sequence in the animation, it's a pretty tall feat over such a short time, even for a magic carpet. As explained in the official Art and Making of Aladdin book, the live-action movie aims to give this scene a greater sense of realism, so instead of an international flight, this time the magic carpet takes Jasmine and Aladdin on a tour of the area and coastline surrounding Agrabah. Changing the locations in the magic carpet ride and finishing back in Agrabah rather than China also gives an opportunity for the film to further highlight Jasmine's love for her people and country. And speaking of Princess Jasmine, there are some problematic moments in the original animation that the filmmakers were clearly keen to avoid in the new movie. Jasmine was only 15 years old in the original film, being a few days away from turning 16. And so the scene where she seduces Jafar to distract him from Aladdin's arrival feels rather icky. For the remake, Disney obviously didn't want to recreate a scene of a 15 or 16 year old Jasmine in chains and a skin bearing outfit, who has to seduce a much older man and is then trapped in an hourglass. That part of the old movie is scrapped in the new version and updated by giving Jasmine much more agency in her own song Speechless. The name of which, by the way, is a neat callback to the moment in the animated movie where the young prince princess was being forced to marry Jafar. You will win, Jafar. <gasps> You're speechless, I see. A fine quality in a wife. I will never marry you. In both stories, Jafar's final wish is his undoing, as he ends up trapped as a genie in a magic lamp. You wanted to be a genie? You got it! Whoop! And everything that goes with it! Phenomenal cosmic powers! Itty bitty living space. The problem with how it happens in the original film is that because Jafar is already in command of the genie, he really should have realised that becoming a genie would make him a captive. The original film basically relies on Jafar acting rather stupidly at this point. The new movie fixes his issue in two steps. First of all, Jafar specifically asks to become the most powerful being in the universe, more powerful than the genie himself. Notice that Jafar doesn't actually ask to become a genie, presumably because he realises that that would involve him being enslaved. Secondly, the genie uses some of the latitude he has when it comes to interpreting wishes to purposely give Jafar a bad outcome. Just before granting Jafar's wish, the genie craftily mutters, a lot of grey area in that, then turns him into a powerful giant red genie, which of course dooms Jafar to live inside a new magic lamp. The big change made to the genie's behaviour in the new movie is that the grey area he has when granting wishes means he can be a lot more manipulative. 
For example, when Aladdin made his first wish, the genie went out of his way to warn him that he needed to be careful with his words. Be specific with your words. The deal is in the detail. However, the genie deliberately didn't offer Jafar the same advice and instead decided to interpret the villain's final wish as negatively as possible. Something fans of the original animation wondered about for years was whether the peddler who introduced the story of Aladdin and the Magic Lamp was meant to be the genie in human form, especially as Robin Williams voiced both characters. Ah, salam and good evening to you, worthy friend. Perhaps you would like to hear the tale? It begins on a dark night. In fact, as the filmmakers acknowledged in a Blu-ray commentary for the film, they had always planned for the connection between the peddler and the genie to be completely obvious by having the peddler reappear at the very end just after Aladdin and Jasmine's final kiss, as the original work print for the movie also shows. Ah, happy end to the tale. Are you sure you don't want to buy this lamp? Like I told you, things are never quite what they seem. <laughs> are they? <laughs> The good news is that in the 2019 movie, it's very clear that the genie and the narrator at the beginning of the film are one and the same, which fixes the lost connection from the 1990s animation. When Prince Ali parades into Agrabah and stomps into the palace on his elephant, it's a truly spectacular and fun moment in the original movie. However, it seems rather strange that everyone simply takes the new Prince Ali at his word about where he's come from, and whether he's even a real prince. Prince Ali of Babwa, of course, I'm delighted to meet you. To fix this and make things more realistic in the live-action movie, it's made clear that both Jasmine and Jafar have never heard of a Babwa, and they both investigate further. Jasmine confronts Prince Ali, telling him that she can't find a Babwa on any of her maps. Aladdin does, however, manage to continue his ruse with a little help from the genie, who adds a Babwa onto one of Jasmine's maps. Although Jafar figures out quite quickly that a Babwa is a made-up place. In the original animation, just before the Cave of Wonders allows Aladdin to enter, it instructs him to touch nothing but the lamp. Although those instructions seem pretty straightforward, in other words, don't touch anything except the lamp, some fans have quibbled that there's a few occasions where Aladdin and Abu do just that with no penalty. For example, they both have contact with the magic carpet, and Aladdin also clearly puts his hands on some of the rocks at one point. The live-action movie fixes this issue by modifying the cave's rules. This time, Jafar tells Aladdin to take no other treasure, and to take nothing but the lamp. It's a subtle change, but the difference is that in the animation the rule was basically don't touch, and in the live action it's don't take. That small rule change clarifies that it's okay to touch or step on anything as long as you don't try to take it. This is doubly important in the new movie because the cave is littered with treasure everywhere, so much so that it's impossible for Aladdin to navigate his way through without touching any of it. The depiction of the characters and culture in the original Aladdin is something that Disney's been criticised for, as it draws on numerous negative stereotypes. When the film was released in 1992, the lyrics to the opening song, Arabian Nights, originally included the line, where they cut off your ear if they don't like your face. To address some of the criticism around that song, for the home entertainment release, Disney changed the line to, where it's flat and immense and the heat is intense, but they did retain the next line, it's barbaric, but hey, it's home. Many still objected to the use of the word barbaric, and so for the remake, Disney rewrote much of the song to avoid controversy this time around. Likewise, in the new movie, when Jasmine can't pay for the food she gives to a couple of poor children, the merchant doesn't threaten to chop off her hand like he did in the animation. Do you know what the penalty is for stealing? There is a little nod to the original moment, though, in how he grabs hold of her arm, but that's as far as it goes. The Prince Ali lyrics have also been corrected and updated. The original line, Sunday Salaam, has been changed to Friday Salaam, to reflect correctly that Friday is the Muslim holy day. And the line in Prince Ali that he's got slaves, he's got servants and flunkies has had the slaves reference removed and been updated to he's got 10,000 servants and flunkies. Jasmine and Aladdin's clothing in the new film has also been updated to be more practical, realistic and less revealing. It's unlikely that a princess would have walked around in that top all of the time. So now Jasmine gets some beautiful new outfits, but which keep her midriff covered up. The costume designers added a nod to Jasmine's bare midriff in the animation, though, by adding a flesh-coloured piece of fabric in the tummy area of Jasmine's dress. Likewise, in the animated movie, Aladdin is bare-chested when he isn't Prince Ali, but Disney covered him up with a shirt so they wouldn't have a topless Aladdin in the live-action version. 
and the three harem girls in the One Jump Ahead song have also been replaced this time around with a group of modestly dressed schoolgirls. Now, did you spot any plot holes or mistakes in the new movie? Let me know in the comments below and subscribe to enter my Aladdin giveaway. Congratulations to the winner of my Game of Thrones giveaway. Contact me via email from my about page so I can send you your prize. Tap left to learn all about Jasmine and Jafar's dark secret history in my Aladdin theory video. Or tap right for another video you're sure to like. Thanks for watching and see you next time, yippee ki movie lovers!